today. Um, my job is to lead product development at NPR's library. Um, the research archives and data strategy group. So welcome again. And now about Teresa. Teresa is the team lead of InfoDesk Services at the Minor Corporation, which is a federally funded research and development center. And she's tasked with standing up 3D printers to information center workers. Prior to supervising the frontline information desk, Teresa worked at Monitor as lead information analyst and a team working as researcher, analyst, and monitor. She received her master's of science degree in library studies from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and her undergraduate degree from Chapel Hill University. Welcome, Teresa. Good morning. We're going to be talking about the 3D printing service at Miter um, and how we try to use it to redefine the library services. So, what is Miter? Miter is a federally funded research and development center, or an FFRDC. FFRDCs were established to bring public sector resources and science and technology to work for the federal government in an independent and conflict free environment. Other FFRDCs you may have heard of include RAND, Aerospace, and the National Labs. Today we operate seven FFRDCs that serve a variety of government clients, including the Department of Defense, the Intelligence Community, FF, FAA, the IRS, the VA, Department of Homeland Security, the Federal Judiciary, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, and NIST is our most recent FFRDC, and we're supporting them in their cybersecurity mission. So the great thing about working at MITRE as a uh, reference or research librarian and analyst is it's a very broad topic area. We have two major locations. We have one in McLean, Virginia, and one in Bedford, Mass. We have sites across the country and across the world where our researchers are embedded with our government sponsors. Here's a little bit about my department, Information Services. We are a staff of 27. We have four different teams, InfoDesk Services, which is the team that I'm a, I'm a part of, and that's your frontline reference and research service. We have a custom research group, which does the longer term ad hoc research requests, as well as being part of long term projects as an embedded function. We have our information resources suite, which negotiates and, and chooses our digital libraries. And our newest group, Knowledge Management, uh, I'm sorry, Knowledge Stewardship Services, stewards high value content in the organization, content that's corporate wide and, 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 and high value. This is our team, InfoDesk Services, and you see a picture of our location in Bedford, Mass. Again, we have two info centers. You can see that we have journals, but we don't see any books. So several years ago, we got rid of our circulating book collection. We have a very small um, reference collection. Mostly are, those are the books that are still really highly uh, relevant in technologies that haven't matured as quickly as others, for example, Riva. If we move to more of a collaborative space in our library, you can see that there is a seating area in the front. Then you see the reference desk in a half moon shape. And then beyond that is a four person office. The libraries are located in high traffic areas. This one is located across from the coffee station. And the one in uh, Virginia is located near the cafeteria. So our focus here is in developing a learning commons and a collaboration space. So back to 3D printing. So we got 3D printers in August of 2014. We had a soft release in October, and we had a full release in December. And we did it this way because we really needed to learn about the technologies ourselves before we were helping other people. Some staff challenge us as to why we were bringing in 3D printers. Did it fit in with the mission of Miter? Did it fit in with the mission of the library? And our response has been that libraries have always been a learning, a place of learning, and um, you really need to have hands-on discovery to really make that learning happen. 
and that the open location encourages collaboration across departmental organizations, and the neutral setting encourages risk taking. There are three major types of these uh, printing processes. The first one, um, photopolymerization, uses light to cure a liquid or a resin in the solid. The analogy of how this functions, it functions like a um, inkjet printer. The next one is granular material binding, which uses an ener energy source like a laser to fuse together layers of powder. And then lastly, and this is the type that we use, is fused deposition modeling. Extruded small beads of material harden immediately to form layers. And the analogy we use to explain to staff how this work works is that it works like a glue gun. So these are the three major types. There's a couple of others that really aren't relevant for our setting, um, bioprinting and nanoscale 3D printing. The benefits of our technology, the fused deposition modeling, it's a much safer technology and it has fewer health and safety issues with it. Once we set up our service, we had to define how it could be used, what the parameters or rules were. And the first one was first come, first serve. When you use 3D printing software, it'll estimate for you how long the job will take to print. It's an estimate, um, not gonna necessarily be that long. If your job fails along the way, you might stop and restart. So what we encourage staff to do is write down the estimated end time so that the next person coming in can get an idea of when they should come back. It's self-service, although we guide people along the way. In our setting, we really encourage people to do the process themselves so they can learn it and understand it. In a public setting, a lot of the 3D printer services are staff-mediated, which is understandable when your technology budgets are low and replacing things isn't an option. At this point, it's no cost to the user and we're absor absorbing the cost of the filament. If the filament costs go sky high, we may consider charging back on the filament. Of course, we have um, restrictions on what you can print, and, as well as saying that it's for work-related use with the understanding that people need to play with the technology to understand what it's even capable of. So here's what you need to get started. You need a 3D printer, filament, and some tools. What you'll see is we have a computer next to our 3D printer so that people can build their 3D print jobs or download objects that are already designed and send them to the 3D printer. This particular printer model allows you to send the design through USB to the printer. You can also plug in a thumb drive and just sneak your net it over from your office. Ours does not have Wi-Fi capabilities, but some printers do. We have a MakerBot replicator fifth generation. Um, the build space is about 10 by eight by six inches. The MakerBot replicator five costs about $2,900 in August of 2014. The filament costs between 43, I'm sorry, 48 and $65 for a two pound spool. And to give you an idea of how much material that is, it, a two pound spool will produce about 400 chess pieces. The filament is polylactic acid, which is a non-toxic resin made of sugar derived from field corn and has a semi-sweet smell and heated. As you see, the tools, we have some um, safety items. We have gloves and we have goggles. When you take something off the 3D printer, it's so well adhered, sometimes it flies. We encourage people to use them, but we don't police that. You also see some post-processing tools like snippers. And one really important item is this small rectangular packet on the bottom left-hand corner is the desiccant. So PLA will really absorb moisture in the air. And when not in use, we have them stored in Ziploc bags with the desiccant. Once coming, after the weekend, coming back in, we try to reload a different color so that the um, filament won't fail. So what have we used it for? First, I'd like to talk to you about our peg, which is for some reason one of people's, uh, people's favorite objects when they visit our object collection. So you can't print over negative space. So when you orient your print, you have to think about how to position on the mill platform. If I position the pig on his feet, he had a lot of support structures underneath him. We've reoriented him to print on his back, and then when done, we break off the support structures. Here are some of the things we've used our 3D printer for. 
replacement parts. Um, there was a group at Miter who were in a particular building where the bathroom stall would not latch, and they got tired of facilities waiting to replace that part, so they made them themselves. You can also use them for custom parts. We had a speaker come to Miter from the organization called Enable, and his group pairs volunteers who have 3D printers with children who need prosthetic hands. We haven't gone that far with my at Miter with being part of that initiative because of all the liability issues involved with that. You can also make functioning prototypes. We've had staff come to make uh, for test fitting to make a part to see if it's correct before they fabricate it in something like metal. Pseudolife replicas. We do not own a 3D scanner. Um, you can buy a 3D scanner. Make a buy has one for about eight or nine hundred dollars. You can also go to locations that will do 3D scans and then print them for you. For example, there's an organization or rather a company called Do, D-O-O-B, and they will 3D scan your body and print it for $95 for a 10, 10 centimeter um, mini me. You can also use a 3D printer for visual aids. And we've had staff make mathematical structures that are hard to visualize as well as topographical maps. Once we got our 3D printer service up and running and we were at full release in December, we started our marketing effort. There were the things you might expect of what we did. Um, some things that became more important than we realized was the actual sample collection. We have a lot of staff interested who aren't really ready to jump in, but they stop by the information desk frequently to see if what new objects have been printed. We also have a social networking site at Meijer called Handshake, which you can use inside the company as well as with Meijer partners. And we built a 3D printing Handshake site, and we have members talking back and forth across that platform. Another great way for people across organizations to get to know each other. People are troubleshooting across it and sharing items of um, news about what's happening in the 3D printing world. There's a lot of differences between the consumer or desktop models and the professional 3D printer models. So the research firm IDC defines a commercial, I'm sorry, a consumer 3D printer as something that costs less than $5,000. Um, something that it comes pre-assembled on a kit, a plug and play item. The professional printers they define as something over five thousand dollars. So we have a commercial, a consumer, or a desktop version. And you can see on the left hand side, those are the items that are printed with our printer. And on the right hand side is a special 3D printer. What we're comparing ourselves to is the Stratasys Object Eden, a printer that we have at Meyer that's somewhat old. It's, um, in 2007, it cost hundred thousand dollars. You can see there's a huge price point difference. With the top item of the teapot, the, the gradual curves and the lack of detail, our printer performs fine. The lower item, I'm not sure if you can see it in the slide, but the um, gray item on the left, there's a lot of surface failures and holes, and the, the detail doesn't show up as crisply. On the right hand side, it's very smooth and very accurate. And one of the reasons is this, because the professional 3D printer is using that process called photopolymerization or stereolithography, they have um, a different support structure that is dissolvable. So they do a post-processing technique to remove the support structure, and they end up with a much smoother surface and finer detail. Here are some of the things we've built. So if you start from the upper left-hand side, you'll see our virtual reality goggles. We had a staff member print the goggles, which are in the real material, purchase commercial 3D lenses, and then provided a place in front of the goggles to slide in a smartphone so that you could view things with your virtual reality goggles. We have another staff member going again clockwise, making a slit. And he was uh, making it for a health IT group at Miter just to show them what was possible. So the slit, the great thing about that is it can be scaled up and down the side and now we can custom print the size, different size splints depending on the size of the person who needs it. So it would be more um, accurate for younger children. Also, these kind of medical supplies, there's been a lot of discussions around disaster areas or disaster zones. If 3D printers 
where in those areas before disasters happen, they could print items that as needed. The reality is printing does take time, and so to scale up might not be realistic, but we might get there. The next item is a case for a Raspberry Pi. And then we also have a, a shelf marker, so something a little bit more traditional librarian, where you can label your, your um, collections on the shelf, for example. Next, we have a wrench, and the um, part you turn in the center was printed at the same time, and you have to work it a little bit with your thumb to break the support material so that it actually um, opens and closes. While this maybe is not that useful because we have wrenches, they have sent 3D printers up to the International Space Station um, to be able to test it with zero gravity and see if they can develop tools and parts when needed. Next, we have sort of an example that you might see a lot of teens doing in public libraries or in high school libraries, phone holders and iPhone cases. So how is it received? We have a photo here of a 3D printed car that my colleague Chris and I saw at MakerCon last September in Queens. So the chassis is completely 3D printed. So what's great about the 3D printer is it sparks conversation. We have a lot of people who are who hear the printer printing and come over and see what it's all about. They collaborate with each other, they problem solve with each other, and they're meeting each other again across the departmental organizations. We've had a lot of success with demos that we've done. We had an information expo where different departments in the organization maybe to head about 10 tables and people came through on their lunch hour to see what was available. The 3D printer, because it was loud and novel, we had 140 visitors and were able to talk to them about a 3D print center. We've also done a lot with STEM events. We've had the Girl Scouts come, and most recently we had a successful Take Our Children to Work Day, where kids came, got to touch the pieces, got to watch something print. People bring um, my clients, some VIP clients, to see the printer and staff are um, making designs that they're actually using with customers. I had one user tell me that IT is getting cheaper and smaller, and the ability to put IT in the field is becoming more practical. He thinks there's a need for a highly customized assembly option. In his case, he was developing a customized rigging in a lab where he was trying to put a camera and a phone over a, a, a space, and he developed a special clip to make sure everything could hang together. Pretend you see another slide because I forgot a slide and then I could go to public release again. But the, you know, the question is, were we successful? Did we re redefine our library with the 3D printer? I would say we're getting there. Um, the additional traffic brought awareness to our core services. We've had more face-to-face -face interactions with our customers, and more importantly, our potential customers, non-users, can hear more about what services we offer. And people are really excited about the collaborating and the problem solving and they're cheering each other on by the printer. Of course, there are issues in terms of the amount of time it takes to run this kind of service. So the downsides are um, the device needs maintenance and it's also down. It requires a lot of documentation and there's some other organizations require training before using these kind of machines. We felt that our user base would be less likely to use it if we did that, so there's a lot of ad hoc orientation right by the printer. Some people, it's so plug and play, they sit down and use it, they don't even need directions. Some people really need their hands held to walk through the process. So now I'm going to transition a little bit to talk about things you might want to consider if you are setting up your own 3D printer service. There's a lot of items here, I'm just going to highlight a couple of them. The replacement cycle for 3D printers is about two to three years. There are health and safety issues. So with those photopolymer, photopolymerization printers, the ones that use the liquid resin that's hardened by a laser, cured by a laser, there's toxicity issues with the resin. It has to be disposed of in a certain way. And there's fumes, so it requires ventilation. With our printer, the only safety issue really is that the extruder nozzle, which is the very tip where the filament comes out, heats up to 215 degrees Celsius. Despite that one issue, we've been operating our 3D printer in a public space. It's available 24-7, um, even at nighttime. 
And this is really required because 3D print jobs take so long that you have to start them and let them run overnight. Another issue is noise. So OSHA says that workers can be exposed to up to 85 decibels of noise in a narrow day. We measure a 3D printer with a decibel reader and we came up with 75. And the staff felt at the time of that reading that the printer wasn't as noisy as it sometimes is. Other printers might not have that issue, but it's a big issue when choosing a 3D printer. There's a lot of market volatility. So a lot of 3D printers are going through mergers and acquisitions. A lot of Kickstarter campaigns. There's one 3D printer called um, Tico, T-I-K-O, that's raised over two million on Kickstarter. And the conventional printer companies are getting into the market, like HP, and some companies you wouldn't even think of that would be interested, like Dremel. You have to plan, plan for downtime. We have one printer at each location. It'd really be much better if we had two at each location. We've had a lot of downtime, I would say maybe even 50% downtime. And this has been done due to a lot of extruders. There are intellectual property issues. Objects can be covered by design patents. And copying CAD files and scanning and printing an object can be covered by copyright. And product liability can be against the person making the file, the person providing the service, and the manufacturer of the 3D printer. So what's important from the perspective of a user? This is from an IDC report where they survey people who um, acquire document and content management technologies, so think traditional printers. And they surveyed 1,000 people. And out of that group of people, 20 to 25% of them had experience with 3D printers. So they just asked these questions to those people who had experience. And you can see the number one issue for people in terms of choosing a 3D printer or being happy with it is the um, services and support to suppliers. So how good is the help desk or the service desk and getting back to you and repairing your parts if you have a, a warranty or a maintenance plan and helping you troubleshoot it. The next is ease of use. The more plug and play, the better and the speed at which it 3D prints. So here are some common problems with 3D printers. And I think the most important thing when you're operating a consumer or desktop model in a corporate setting is to temper people's expectations so that they're not disappointed and reiterate to them that we're using a product that's designed for home use um, in a company like that. So going from the upper left-hand side around, the first thing you see is some poor service quality, and we discussed that earlier when we compared the other printers. And then we have a flawed extruder. The MakerBot extruders, the good news is that they're modular, and they're attached by magnets, and you can switch them out. But if you go with a printer that has a lot of clogging issues, you really need to have some backup extruders, so you can switch them out while you're waiting for the extruders to get repaired. The next, you see curling. In a corporate setting, you can't control where your HVAC system is going to blast down hot or cold air. When the air temperature is not correct, sometimes you'll have some failure. So in fact, the um, red material, which is the filament, is pulling up the blue tape on the surface. The blue tape is down in order to prepare the surface to grab onto or hold the 3D printed object. Next, it's a little bit hard to see, but there's core extrusion. And I expect perhaps that the extruder is flogged, but it's not flogged all the way, and so you don't get as much material coming out as, as you might expect. And then the filament can also knot or tangle. It's coming off of a reel, and if in um, the middle of the night it gets twisted on itself, it's gonna, the filament will break, and then the print job will fail and just shut down. We've had some problems with power issues in Northern Virginia. We have one user who was very frustrated because he had longer print jobs but he was kind enough to bring in a universal power supply and lend it to us. So a lot of these failures are also caused by bad design. If you have people designing their own files, um, that could be why the product, the item is failing. I would say um, some of our users are building designs from already available 3D models that they find on the internet and some are designing their own. Again, pretend there's another slide. And I um, just want to conclude that 3D printers have been successful in our environment with elevating our credibility in the fine tech community. We report up to the CIO, so this is seen as very favorable because they have a hard time thinking, they think there's a technology solution for everything, 
So whereas they understand our need for a mission, this really helps them see that we're kind of on the bandwagon. It is driving more traffic to our physical spaces, and it's really helping us meet non-Lyme users. So if you um, want to start a 3D printing service, I hope you'll be able to learn from some of our experiences. The 3D printer is an exciting addition to our service, but our core service remains reference, research, and analysis. If this has piqued your interest in MITRE, um, please be on the lookout for a pending job rec for an information analyst at our MITRE McLean office at the info desk. So what's next at the info desk? We'd like to think about more technologies that we can bring in. Possibly we may be purchasing a new 3D printer, one with less downtime issues. And we'd also like to continue plugging the space in the learning space and perhaps rotate out different, te rotate out different technologies. So iPads are kind of old news, but now we're considering a digital magazine platform. If you bring iPads in, people can access the collection in the ecosystem. Arduinos is another consideration in open source computer hardware, and the Raspberry Pis, the single board computers, little bits, which you may have seen at the um, Expo, which is a library of electronic modules that you can build electronics without soldering, wiring, or programming. And then my personal favorite, conductive thread and LEDs, uh, which branches off to wearable computers. So if we go in this direction, most likely what we'll do is we'll partner with people in the organization perhaps bring in a staff member who has some expertise and do lunchtime um, demonstrations and hands-on um, experiences. Here are some resources to get you started. There really isn't that much out there that has um, any heft to it about 3D printing at corporate libraries, but here are some things to look at. Make Magazine has an annual guide where they rate 3D printers. That's very helpful. There is a makerspace and libraries listserv, um, and here are some other articles and books that might be interesting. There are also several conferences to follow. MakerCon is the conference I mentioned earlier. The great thing about MakerCon is the maker community is willing to help, and there's no, unlike a scientific uh, organization, everyone's at the same level, and they're all excited to share what they know, which is always really good. 3D printer world and also, of course, the Consumer Electronics Show, which can be overwhelming, but it can help you see what's out there and what's coming down the pipe. If you want to use a 3D printer and you don't have a, an idea of what to print, there are plenty of 3D model repositories. Thingiverse, which is the MakerBot um, version of this 3D model repository, makes things available through common um, Creative Commons, so that helps alleviate some of the copyright issues. Next, if you want to design your own file, CAD programming software is quite expensive and you need, there is a learning curve in order to use it. There are some free 3D modeling programs that you can use to design things. Here's just a screenshot of our 3D printing log to give you an idea of how we're sort of managing the um, ins and outs of people signing up. And so we've listed here restrictions on use as well as some of our safety concerns. People have to sign up, put down their start time and end time. This gives an expert an idea of when the printer will be available. We also ask them to write down what they're printing and give us a contact. And then after, and maybe once a month, I'll call people to find out how their print job was and what they were using it for, and it helps me generate use, story, use case stories. So with that, I'll open up the floor to questions, and thank you for listening to my, my presentation.